When you take a look at the map of the world, chances are you'll see Greenland the size of the continent of Africa. In reality, Africa is 14 times larger. The same holds true for India. On the map, India much smaller than it should be, when India, in reality, is larger than all Scandinavian countries put together. How many of you didn't know that? Come on. <laughs> now, the economist Oliver Stunkel calls it a grotesque distortion, and that's because of the Western-centric view of the world. Now, the narrative around emerging economies has always been dwelling on negativity, failure. But if you take a broader perspective, well, these countries have never had it better. We've had a prolonged period of peace and prosperity. People are living longer. And when you take a look at poverty, it's on the decline. In fact, in the case of China, poverty has gone from 80% to just over 1% in the period of 30 years. 850 million people have been pulled out of poverty in that time frame. Amazing. And technology is changing everything. The promise of technology, technology promising to unleash the human potential. Hence, a discussion this morning, a world of opportunity I'm so proud to be introducing our speakers this morning. We have Strive, who was part of the telecom revolution in Africa 30 years ago at a time when most Africans didn't know how the phone looked like. We have Anthony, advancing mobility, financial inclusion in Southeast Asia. And we have Lei, who's been funding, well, China's technology dream, along with the dreams of the US, Europe, and the rest of Asia. So, Rockstar entrepreneurs this morning for you. Lei, let's start with you. 200 years on, China back to being one of the growth engines in the world. What is most inspiring about the Chinese story? Well, it's really this innovation and entrepreneurship. When you think about the China's innovation, it's not just the, the tiny part of the internet. It's everywhere. It's that triple combination of industrialization, urbanization, and digital revolution all happening at the same time. Just think about China going down the street because the last 30 years have been so much pent up demand for this entrepreneurship and innovation. You're having new companies starting so many every day. Just imagine that you have, you know, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan, and Larry Page, and Mark Zuckerberg all walk down the street at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what's happening in China. You have startup doing traditional, conventional industries. You have the first startup on the you know, eye clinics, or uh, vet clinics, or the uh, uh, first snack food company, beverage company, as well as company like Tencent Alibaba. It's all happening at the same time. I think that's that power of that triple combination that matters. And in the case of Africa Strive, McKinsey calls African nations lions on the prowl. And you've often talked about great resources, great capacity. Tell us about the African story. Well, first, it's great to be back in Singapore. And um, what an inspiring place. And we get inspired by Singapore, even as big as we are on the map. <laughs> the, we, um, our mission is to bring Africa to the center of the world, where it belongs as the heart of the world. So, you know, for us, the African story is to remind the world that although we are, we, we are enticed by a single landmass, we are 54 nations, just like Asia is 40, 48, I think, nations. And the level of development, the complexity of the different countries have to be seen in that context. We ourselves as Africans are, have a vision to be seen as one Africa. We have a vision to, be, uh, to develop an economic narrative that says, hey, we are 1.2 billion people. We're, uh, we have an economy, $2.5 trillion. 
how do we open this into a global marketplace so that you see us as a global partner? And in the case of Southeast Asia, you've always said, Anthony, we live and die Southeast Asia. Why is Southeast Asia such a dream market for you? We do. We live and die here. We're born here. We will die here. Um, that's the beauty of this region. There's so much excitement. Um, it's a perfect spring for us. We see, as Lay shared, rural urban migration in the masses. We see price of smartphones and data falling. We see democratizing of technology. We see this world where the rise of millennials and they want everything now and they want it immediate and they're consuming at huge loads of data, huge loads of services. Very exciting for us. At the same time, what do we see? We see some massive problems like congestion, uh, gridlock cities, uh, Manila, Bangkok, Jakarta. Once a minister shared with me, Jakarta is not traffic jam. It's the largest parking lot in the world. <laughs> With that, it comes plenty of opportunities. So for example, in our case, we see the perfect opportunity for solving problems that are caused by congestion, whether it's thinking about not having to drive anymore, not having to park, not having to think about spending my whole lunch hour going out to get food, having it delivered immediately for within 20 minutes not having to find an ATM network that outside of Singapore are sparse. I can send and mon receive money anywhere at the convenience of my smartphone. So that, huge problems, but huge opportunities. All right, gentlemen, 1.4 billion in China, 650 million in Southeast Asia, 1.2 billion in Africa. What is the single biggest opportunity, Lei? Well, innovation happens everywhere. A single biggest opportunity I would say is the opportunity to leapfrog, that you don't really have to replicate the traditional infrastructure. Take, uh, you know, Anthony just talked about the, the digital revolution. Take the payment, for example. China doesn't have to have all those traditional payment infrastructure. Look at WeChat Pay and Alipay. Essentially, you can do almost everything. You can walk away without your wallet. And I think that actually inspire complete different set of uh, companies born in that digital savvy and the uh, mobile native environment. And I think that innovation also going beyond the digital revolution. You say, let's say, look at the biotech, just look at how many scientists coming back to China. So the reverse brain drain, if you will. The last one year, the biotech life science startup is bigger than last 10 year combined times two. So that, that, that's the much innovation happening in every sector. I think that's, that's the opportunity to leapfrog. We don't have to replicate the traditional retail infrastructure, traditional payment network, and that we can just go direct to the digital and mobile native environment. Shrive? Well, you know, for us as Africa, <clears throat> you know, I'm reminded of what the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi said, he said, you know, I haven't had a great idea since I was 26. So innovation happens with young people. So our advantage is going to be our youth. We are the youngest continent on the, in the world, average age 19. The energy of our continent is what we have to harness for the future the creativity. Uh, we have to build livelihoods around these young people. Now notice I'm not saying jobs anymore. We have to build livelihoods. In other words, we have to bring them out of the starting blocks as entrepreneurs from day one in ways that the world has not seen before. Because the mo all the models that are there were created by men and we will create new models. Anthony? <coughs> Well, Lay's right. I think first, I'd like to bridge both. Um, one is on, on, on payments. Uh, we don't see just payments. We see massive financial inclusion. Um, the disparity of, of wealth and 
the, because, out, again, outside of Singapore in the region, the infrastructure isn't there yet. And because of that, it creates this lock of a uh, poverty trap for, for those who, can't, um, who are not as blessed as us. Mm -hmm. And when we can find ways to uplift millions and create, you know, I always say to our guys, um, it's not about, and especially young startups, Grab Ventures uh, sponsors a lot of these, mm -hmm. It's not about giving them fish. It's about investing in the best tools and teach them how to fish. Give them the best fishing boat, the best fishing rod, and let them fish. Let them gain that pride, that self-confidence that I can do it myself. And then uplift millions. Take them from where they are today to a new economic reality. That's what we should be betting on. Now we talk about the opportunities, but a lot of investors from the Western world when they start venturing into the emerging world, they tend to get it wrong. We've seen the likes of Uber struggling in markets like Southeast Asia, for instance. What is the, what's the thing that the West gets wrong about China? Well, I think the, back 10, 20 years ago, you look at all the Chinese business models. It doesn't matter if it's B2B, B2C, essentially it was all C2C, copy to China. <laughs> and, and, but today, you know, China has innovated so much, you almost have to be so, you know, locally adaptive, not just adaptive, but also have to innovate from China. You look at uh, what the lacks of DD does in China, just so much innovation and uh, beyond, well beyond what Uber doing. We look at how much uh, uh, Tencent doing on WeChat as, uh, versus the traditional uh, Facebook network infrastructure. And, there's, and, and take another even traditional company that we invested called Bell. It's a traditional you know, women footwear company that, uh, that uh, selling shoes uh, and uh, supposedly should be disrupted by the internet and e-commerce and uh, the lacks of Alibaba and Amazon, but now thriving by leveraging technology uh, to do it better. I think that people just completely underestimated and uh, also just using the traditional playbook that worked well for them, uh, and, but that won't work well for them today. The lacks of Coca-Cola, the you know, PNG just selling for every Chinese, you got to sell one bottle of Coke, you can get 1.4 billion. <laughs> that just doesn't work anymore. And Strife, in the case of Africa, people tend to think that it is one country. Right. Uh, and that is a challenge for a lot of uh, investors from outside the region. Well, yeah, I suppose it's like saying India and China are one country. I wish them <laughs> well. Um, but look, we, 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 we don't get ourselves preoccupied with the idea that how does the world look at us? I think what's... But what does the world get wrong? It's not so much as what the world gets wrong. I think a lot of it is in the context of our traditional relationship. It's a bit like a parent and a child. Uh, we have a historical relationship which, in, with my, with, which we sometimes need to reset. We're a lot, when, when the children are older and they have their own aspirations and their own visions, we need the world to see us as a partner, mm. uh, not as a we are often find ourselves suspicious because of the historical context. So we sometimes need to reset this. Africa is ready to engage the world as a partner, and this is why our relationship with China has worked so well, and why we are so defensive about our relationship with China, because it's been a partnership, and it has seen the greatest growth between the two regions than we've ever seen. And so, um, so it's not so much as what mistakes, what can we learn from our past associations, and how do we build the respect that we are equal partners? Anthony? <clears throat> well, first of all, I need to be careful. Uh, Uber has become a shareholder since <laughs> March 23rd, so tremendous respect for them. Uh, but. <laughs> No offense intended, though. It's just that, you know, they, they, they had to understand the markets better. Yeah. 
so exactly right. I think the West it sees um, consumer apps as, you know, hey, for ride hailing in the States, I think of Uber. For food delivery, I think of Uber Eats. Uh, for uh, payments, I think PayPal, right? It's, it's very uniformed, um, one app. I think what they haven't seen is this crop of super apps that come from China that Southeast Asia has embraced, where on one app, you can order groceries, you can send and receive money, you can book your car, motorbike, you can do multitude of things, super apps, the emergence of them. And we've seen this big behavioral change, especially among the youth consumers in Southeast Asia. That's our chance. Grab is the super app of Southeast Asia. Number two, I would say the fragmentation. I think a lot of people think, hey, you know, can this cookie cutter model work in Singapore? It's going to work in Malaysia. It's going to work in Myanmar. I can guarantee you that is not the case. Mm. Very different laws, very different languages, very different, you know, one ride hailing law here is a different ride hailing law here. And you just can't apply that cookie cutter world. And the ability to develop that muscle to tackle these nuances and overcome it becomes a moat. You know, did you want to add? Yeah, I, if I could add on that is the, the using the Chinese business model innovation start to export to the other Asian regions. Uh, you know, Grab, we were investor in Didi, and we together invested in Grab early on. And similarly... You've done well. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Great work. And uh, the, the, we had another example that called Wuha Brothers in Korea, which actually was um, um, a much weaker competitor on food delivery business in the past. We invested and brought them to work with Meituan and learn how... Meta actually how much integrate that with the delivery, not just being the information marketplace. And similarly, you have Traveloka that's essentially learning from China of China. So you have all those Chinese business model innovation now starting to be uh, really welcoming into other regions because sh we share similar demographics, it's mobile native, and uh, in young, we call it three lows, the users. Uh, uh, low age, uh, low income, <laughs> and uh, low, low college degree education. So, <laughs> and how you develop an app that's all in one for them, that's convenient and embedded in their wallet. I think that actually works out really, really well. Oh, let, let's pick up on demographics because both Anthony and Strive have been talking about the young population. In Africa, 60% below 25. In Southeast Asia, I think it's 50% or more than 50% below 30. Talk to me, because in terms of the young, you know, population growth, it could be a boon or a bane. There's potential, but if you don't provide them with the jobs, for instance, in Africa, that's going to be a problem. C certainly, and we, you know, it just doesn't happen by itself. We're going to have to uh, be very specific in providing education and skills. But let me just say this, you know, when you look at the numbers, and for those who want to look at Africa, we'd love you to come and see our tourism, but also look at our economic numbers, and you'd be surprised. For instance, we have almost 500 million people with smartphones. Yeah. How many people would have thought that? We have more more phones in, uh, mobile phones in Africa than in Europe and North America put together, okay? The rate of growth and adaptation is as high as any other part of the world. The innovations are no longer confined to any part of the world. The next unicorns can come out of Nairobi, they can come out of uh, Jakarta, they can come out of Cape Town or Harare, mm -hmm. okay? The, what is common is that you're dealing with young, high-energy, uh, highly connected. They are connected to each other, they are talking to each other, even to Riyadh, right? They're connected. So, this is, this is the new norm, okay? And we've got to ride that new norm 
and accept that it's, going to, it's highly disruptive, yes, but well, let's be optimistic with it. I'm an optimist. So it's Anthony. Yeah, I'm considered old um, in, in <laughs> this part of the world, I know. Oh, Man, come on. I'm, I'm done, um, over the hill. Um, <laughs> so you're right, over 50% are millennials, um, so very young. And you know, what do we complain about young people? Impatience, everything they want now. Um, but that's where companies like us can thrive. All our services are on demand. It's today, they want everything, video, they want ride hailing, they want food, they want everything on demand. Now, how do you celebrate now in all your services? That's number one. Number two is they are also bustling with energy and creativity. They're full of it, right? They, are, they just can't stand still. How do you embrace that? Now, for us, it's Grab Ventures, there's Grab Platform, open ecosystem, plug them in as local startups and let them rise and let them serve their local communities and let them rise. But you, with uh, at least in our case, have platforms that serve, in our case, 125 million consumers. How do we let them plug instantly and let them move fast? Whether it's for us, it's whether it's local startups from Indonesia or Pingan Good Doctor in China, which is the largest online doctor app, and they can plug in, instantly access 125 million, instantly have, <coughs> be able to pay using GrabPay all across the region. Ali, you're in China, Europe, US, you're everywhere. How, how, how's the young changing the consumption story? Well, I think China is in an interesting juncture. We are actually, because of the past one-child policy in the law, starting from five years ago, we start to have a peaking and, uh, and also exactly because of this one child policy that the, the people entering into the marriage age right now sharply, we have a sharp drop actually uh, in the next five, 10 years. And despite that, we, we sort of released the one child policy. Now you have you know, the two children, but the uh, voluntary people keep on delaying the birth. And the, so, so we do have a demographic challenge. But I think the, uh, the government is addressing that by emphasizing quality of education, quality of services. Earlier, you heard about Vice President Wang Qishan talk about the quality of growth is much more important than the quantity. So I think that you know, really expresses itself in every single aspect of consumer goods and consumer innovation. Just that not the number of goods, it's about you know, high quality stuff, high quality you know, you know, organic food, you know, like, you know, for example, we, we invest in actually now China's largest uh, domestic o organic dog food company <laughs> that, uh, that the millennials also have now the much more the humanization for animals. Now, now you know, sometimes, you know, people eat, you know, uh, McDonald's and you feed their dogs and, you know, that organic dog food. <laughs> so that you're seeing much more uh, the emphasizing people are treating uh, each other and treating family members with high quality products and high quality services. I think the quality is the primary driver of the consumerization of China. As much as we are looking at the opportunities in emerging economies, there are also big concerns. In your respective regions and countries, what would that be? In Africa, would that be governance, for instance? Of course, that's a given, but I think sustainability. So, uh, you know, we, as big as our continent is, it's a fragile, fragile ecosystem. And we tend to be at the when we look at the environmental issues, okay, so we may not be big contributors, but we are certainly big victims. And our, our, so we are facing the sustainability issues around climate change, with uh, use of resources, uh, water, all these. So it is fragile, and it will face in a rapidly increased population. So we, we are challenged. Anthony, <coughs> for Southeast Asia? Yeah. Number one, I would, my biggest worry is the income disparity. I think it's, it's huge. I think a lot of people uh, ignore it. I think it's very real. And if we don't uh, serve and help 
the millions that needs to be uplifted, um, I think it's going to be a much bigger problem. And there'll be social revolution, there'll be a lot of problems. So for us, um, it's very easy to say technology will solve everything, mm -hmm. every option, it'll grow every tree. Um, no, I think we have to think about how do human relationships, partnering technology, solve? Um, I'll give you an example. I, I think it's so easy to just believe that technology can solve, but we need to think of it as a bridging solution and not the only solution. Mm. So take, for example, with us uh, in Indonesia, you know, we have the largest million, 1.5 million agents on the ground. So think about Tupperware ladies and men selling micro finance services on the ground, army on the ground, helping those with low internet penetration, low smartphone penetration, and bringing them online. So go offline to bring them online and uplift millions. That's the way. Well, uh, my primary concern is that there are unintended consequences of technology uh, innovation. Um, I think we already start to see the sort of uh, um, the digital gap, if you will, that the top you know, 1% who get really much smarter and much faster to wealth, while the a lot more people left behind. Uh, my question, the question to me is, how do we leverage technology to not only make it a creative disruptor, at the end of the day it's a disruptor, but how to make that to be an equalizer, something that actually help people left behind who actually benefit from technology growth. The early example we give on a uh, traditional shoe uh, retailer we bought called Bell. It was a retailer being around for 30, 20, 25, 30 years. And, and everybody thought they're going to be killed by an internet technology company. There are 120,000 employees going to be out of job. And you, know, you can talk about you can always retrain people, or you can talk about you know, maybe in the future era that not everybody needs to work, and everybody just can go back and play games and get you know, re income redistribution. And I happen to be a believer that, you know, that you know, having the pride of going to work is part of uh, you know, really the uh, human rights. I think that um, you know, we did a lot of work really trying to transform those 120,000 people not only to be the store clerk moving the box, but also to be your you know, fashion divider for their consumers and linking them by WeChat and showing them complete new styles and bringing them back to stores, makes the store more exciting with the technology and makes the store to be the showroom and linking the customers and, and also each clerk run their own shop in the WeChat and so that they actually can have their own virtual store and benefiting from the online sales. There's, there's so much business model innovation that we can leverage technology make the 120,000 people to feel like they're doing something useful, they actually can make money, but doing it in a sustainable way that we, as investors, we own, we are the majority shareholder, actually, I still, I'm the, still the chairman of the company, which manages 120,000 people. Before that, I only manage 50 people. <laughs> so, so that really still trying to, you know, do it in a sustainable way that we all benefit, every stakeholder wins. So that's actually my passion. My passion is to find ways, leverage technology to help to make it more inclusive, and still using, doing it in a market-based system in a sustainable manner. Gentlemen, just one final question to wrap it up. Your call to action at this new economy forum to generate hope for the future, Strife? We need investment. We need to invest in our youth. We need to invest to create jobs and livelihoods. Uh, it's a global economy. We cannot avoid that. And we, from Africa, need to see sustained investment uh, beginning to move in. And you're welcome to invest in Africa. We're ready for business. Anthony? I would say partners. Uh, partnerships, as long as you share the same values, the same principles. And for us, it's about serving Southeast Asia, the local communities, and uplifting them in a sustainable way. If we can find these partners, and you can leverage and work together, you can create so much value, both economic value and social value together. Lei? I would say conscious capitalism and conscious technologist 
that we not only think about maximizing shareholder value, but think about every technology, not only being in the spotlight of science fiction novels, but also can think about the impact implications, how we do that uh, in a sustainable manner, how we do that in a more inclusive manner, how we do that at scale. Strive Masihiwa, Anthony Tan, Zhang Lei, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking them.